So the last topic we'll discuss in today's lecture is semantic segmentation. So far we've talked about methods that output uh, so categories, labels, and bounding boxes. Uh, now we're going to talk about methods that actually try to label every single pixel, which might be helpful if you want to know precisely where the objects are located and what their spatial extents are. And um, in some ways it's actually a little bit simpler because unlike with object detection, now you actually no longer have a variable number of outputs because you have a separate output for every pixel and every pixel is guaranteed to have a label. So in a sense, semantic segmentation can be a little simpler because you don't have to worry about objects being present or not present or how many there are and stuff like that. Uh, but it's a little more complex because your output now is much, much larger. Your output is the same resolution as the original image. Um, so a very simple conceptual starting point to think about semantic segmentation is to think of it as, a, as essentially a per pixel classifier. So you could imagine taking an entire convolutional neural network classifier and centering it at every pixel in the image and evaluating it, maybe with something like zero padding to account for the corners. And that's more or less what semantic segmentation methods try to do. Uh, but there are a few technical challenges with getting this right. So uh, before, uh, we had this view when we talked about uh, having a different classifier at each location. But this was still for the case where the number of locations is you know, smaller than the number of pixels in the image, and you, utilizing kind of a conventional neural net architecture that reduces the resolution with every convolutional layer. But now the problem is that we want the output to have the same resolution as the input. We, we really want every single pixel to have a class, not just every single sliding window location. And this is not hard to do if we never downsample. So if we always have zero padding, stride one, and no pooling, then all of our convolutional response maps will be the same resolution as the original image, and then at the very end, we'll output a class label for every location in the image. And you can absolutely do this. But this is computationally very expensive, because you have these gigantic convolutional uh, response maps, uh, and you, you're going to need quite a few layers, because you want a wide context. So you either have huge filters or many layers, uh, both of which are extremely expensive. So the, the issue that we're faced with in um, semantic segmentation is that we want to assign a semantic class to every single pixel. Uh, don't worry for now about instances. So if you have two adjacent cows, it's just kind of one cow blob, and that's, I guess, okay for some reason. Computer vision people don't seem to worry about this. Um, and a very simple way to do it is to just use multiple layers uh, of convolutions that preserve resolution. If we could implement this, if this was computationally tractable, we might just do this and it would probably work. Uh, by the way, in regard to instances, there are methods that do instance level segmentation that are a little bit more nuanced, uh, but the basic problem statement kind of doesn't care about this. Okay, so most of what we're going to be concerned with for implementing these kind of semantic segmentation methods in practice is how do you avoid maintaining these huge convolutional response maps while still having uh, deep networks uh, that can meaningfully classify every pixel. So the challenge is to design a network architecture that makes this per pixel classification problem computationally tractable. All right, so what we can imagine conceptually is that we're going to have a convolutional stack very much like uh, the ones that we had before when we talked about classification like VGG or ResNet or something. And that's going to reduce resolution as it goes. And then once we've reduced the resolution, then we need to increase the resolution again. So first we reduce the resolution just like a regular comment, and then we get some low resolution but high depth processing in the middle that basically integrates the entire image. So that, that kind of, in the middle there, the network kind of knows where everything in the image is, but the resolution is too low to output a label for every pixel. And then we need to upsample it back up to the full resolution of the image, and then up there we can actually output a label for every pixel. All right, so conceptually everything here is simple. The question is how do we do the upsampling? So we learn about convolutions which take, uh, which either preserve resolution or they reduce resolution. Now we need to learn about a, some kind of unconvolution or, or upsampling operation. This is sometimes called a transpose convolution or a learned upsampling, which takes a lower resolution thing and makes it higher resolution. Okay, so uh, we can call this upsampling or transpose convolution. It's also sometimes also referred to as deconvolution, 
Um, that term is technically a little bit incorrect because deconvolution actually does have a very precise meaning in signal processing, which is different from this. So probably better to call it upsampling or transpose convolution. So let's talk about how this works. First, let me uh, describe again how a regular normal convolution reduces resolution. So if you, let's say that you have a normal convolution with a stride of two. Uh, so that's going to map, uh, if we do no padding in this case, this five by five uh, image into a two by two image. So you take this uh, filter, that becomes the top left, you take uh, the input here is hf by wf, the height and width of the filter, times the number of input channels. The output is 1 by 1 times the number of output channels. So the entire filter is hf by wf by c in by c out. And then you take a patch, you know, stride is, is 2, so you go 2 pixels over, take the top right patch, and that becomes the top right pixel. The transpose convolution is basically going to be the opposite of this. And one of the ways you can think about this is it's a convolution with a fractional stride. So here the stride was 2, which means you go 2 pixels over. If you have a stride of uh, 1 half, then you want to go 1 half pixel over. Uh, now, you could actually do that. You could actually interpolate those pixels. Uh, another way you could do it, uh, which is also very simple, is you can simply output uh, the, the value at multiple positions. And mathematically, uh, those turn out to be uh, almost the same thing. So uh, here you have a 2 by 2 input and a 5 by 5 output. So um, one way you could do it uh, is you could have your input be 1 by 1 by C in, and your output be HF by WF by C out. And the filter now is just, uh, again, it's a four-dimensional tensor, that's C in by HF by WF by C out. So it has a value for every position in a, a three by three, let's say, output patch, and every channel in that patch, and every channel in the input, and it multiplies the corresponding channel in the input by some number and writes into that location. Okay, It's still a linear operation. Uh, one little catch that you might run into is that, well, the filter at this position will output this 3x3 three three region. The filter at this position will output this 3x3 three three region, but they overlap in the middle. So you're going to have two sets of values there in the middle. What do you use there? Well, one very simple choice is to just average them. So every position in the larger response map is going to get multiple different values from different filters, and all the values that it gets get averaged together. So, for example, that pixel in the very middle is actually going to get predictions from uh, quite a few, from, from four separate filters, so they're all averaged together. That's not the only way to transpose convolutions. There are other ways, and you can take this stride equals one-half notion very literally and literally do linear interpolation in the uh, smaller response map, and that's a reasonable choice, too. Okay, um, so that's kind of how you can uh, increase the, the resolution by a, a transpose convolution operation. But there's another problem, which is that our original network had pooling as well. So pooling is another way that we reduce resolution. Uh, and that means that if we want to upsample afterwards, we have to somehow undo the pooling. So you can, you can actually have an unpooling operation. There are a number of different ways to do it. Uh, a simple way to do it is to uh, literally just duplicate the values. So if you have a 2x2 two two input and you want to turn into a 4x4 four four input, you just take the top left corner and tile it 2x2. Two two. You take the top right corner and tile it 2x2. Two two. But another trick you can use, uh, which actually works pretty well and is a bit clever, is each time you perform a pooling operation, you save out which index actually have the max. So uh, in the example here, during the pooling, during the, re the resolution reduction phase, um, in the top left 2x2 two two region, that 5, had the largest value, so we save out the index, the location of that 5. So that when we perform unpooling later, we write the value into the corresponding index. So in that 2x2 two two region, the bottom right had the max, so then when we do unpooling later on, the bottom right is, is the one that's going to get the value, and everything else will get 0. Okay, so just look at this picture and, and, and think about this operation for a second, if it's not entirely clear to you. Every time you pool, you save out the index that had the largest value, and then later on in the network, when you, when you have the corresponding upsampling, uh, you take that index and you save the value of the, uh, 
in the low-resolution map to the corresponding index in the high-resolution map. Now, this of course requires your network to be symmetric, which means that every time you had a pooling, on the other side, when you go back up, you have to have a corresponding unpooling. In general, these networks don't have to be symmetric if they just use these transpose convolutions, but if you use pooling and unpooling, then you have to be symmetric, I guess. And that's okay, that's, that's fine to be symmetric. Okay, so now you can basically, in the upsampling stage, you can re replace your convolutions with these transpose convolutions, and you can replace pooling with these unpooling operations. All right, so a very simple kind of architecture for doing this is, is this sort of bottleneck architecture, where you would typically use a conventional um, convolutional network like VGG or ResNet uh, as the uh, first part, the part that uh, takes the image and puts it in the bottleneck, and then you would flip it around to have transpose convolutions and unpooling to get it back up to the original resolution. And this is the basic design used in the paper called Fully Convolutional Networks for Semantic Segmentation by Long et al. in 2014. Um, so the way that they illustrate is they say, well, let's take some, some standard existing network like VGG, for instance, and you can think of this original network as producing a low resolution uh, classifier. And then you upsample that by taking all of your pooling layers and turning them into unpooling layers and taking all of your convolutions and turning them into these transpose convolutions. So what they call upsampling here is transpose convolutions. Uh, and then they combine this with the, the indices from the pooling. Now, one problem that you might imagine with this uh, approach is that when you shove everything into that bottleneck, maybe some spatial information is actually lost. I mean, pooling layers are intended for losing spatial information. Um, so if you have some unpooling and transpose convolutions afterwards, they'll get your resolution back up, but they might not rec recover the fine spatial detail. Uh, so one idea here is that maybe uh, you can actually combine uh, multiple resolutions when you uh, upsample back up. Maybe you can take the low resolution stuff, upsample it, and combine it with the higher resolution maps that you had before via skip connections. And skip connections are very much like residual connections. So that's the idea behind a design called UNIT. Um, the basic UNIT design has been used in many different areas, including semantic segmentation, but also it's very popular for generative models like GANs, and we'll talk about that later too. So this is a diagram uh, of, of one potential UNIT design. The actual architecture, you can think of it as pretty similar to VGG, but with skip connections. So you can see that there are uh, two convolutional layers uh, at the beginning, so on the top left. Then there is a downsampling by a factor of two, then two more convolutional layers, then downsampling by a factor of two again, and so on. And then when we start upsampling, what we actually do is we upsample the previous layer, and then we take the layer uh, in the original continent that had the same resolution, and we concatenate its activations. So basically, at every upsampling layer, the activations uh, consist of two halves, the upsampling of the previous lower resolution layer and concatenated to it the original layer that had that resolution. And that's indicated by these gray arrows. So the gray arrows basically just take the activations that you had before at that resolution and put them over to your current uh, upsampling layer. And that's indicated by the white boxes. So you can see that every time we upsample, we have a, a little blue part, and that's just uh, obtained with unpooling uh, and transpose convolution. And then we have the white part, which is just the previous activations at that resolution that we had on the input, just concatenated to that. And that's why when we, when we downsample, you can see that we have 64, 128, 256, 512. But when we start upsampling, now, the first time we upsample, we always have double the number of filters. So when we, when we upsample to a re resolution of uh, 104, uh, uh, there you can see there's a, there's a blue bit and a, and a white bit, and the total number of channels is 512. That's because 256 of them are coming from the previous high resolution map, and the other 256 are coming from upsampling the preceding 52 by 52 map. Okay, so um, it's basically, a, a, it, it's a little, a bit of a complicated picture, but it's a very simple idea, which is just copy over the previous activation you had at that resolution to the current upsampling stage. 
Um, and this can work better for preserving uh, some higher resolution detail. Because while those uh, higher resolution maps might not be as semantically meaningful, they might encode useful high frequency details like the positions of edges and boundaries so that when you actually output your segmentation, you'll get it to align perfectly with the actual edge of the cow. Okay, so just to summarize, we covered uh, at this point four standard computer vision problems. Object classification, which we discussed in the previous lecture, object localization, where you have one object and a bounding box, object detection, where you have many objects and many bounding boxes, and now semantic segmentation, where you actually need to output one label per pixel. Uh, and you can see that there are a lot of common themes across these uh, uh, topics, like for example the notion uh, that you can share uh, convolutional activations across locations. Um, you can see that there's a lot of parallels between how we use sliding windows in object localization and object detection and how we do per pixel classification with semantic segmentation. But then there are also a few differences, like for example, the need to regress onto bounding boxes and things like that. All right, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of background on computer vision, especially if you want to do something like this uh, in your final project. Um, this will hopefully give you something to go on. If you want to learn more about it, I would highly recommend reading some of the papers uh, that I referenced as I went along.